Hello everyone and welcome to another Igloo Developers Day session. I'm Stephen Robinson and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about our new service we've been building called suggest for me to help users find appropriate material to read. So as I said, I'm Stephen Robinson and I'm the Projects and Operations Developer at Lancaster University Library. Um, we're part of a small institution in the northwest of the UK with approximately 12,500 full-time students, about 1,200 academic staff and 1,600 non-academic staff with campuses around the world in China, Malaysia, Ghana, um, as well as the one recently opened in Leipzig in Germany. And we were recently awarded the gold in the Teaching Excellence Framework. So to support all this, we obviously use a range of different products and core in the library, these are some of these are the Ex Libris products. So we use Alma, Primo and Leganto. Campus M is also in use at the institution by our IT partnering innovation team to provide our mobile app, iLancaster. So with that out of the way, I'm often asked, well, what's your favorite thing about being a software developer? And especially what's your favorite thing about being a software developer in HE? Well, there's a lot of different things. Um, it could be the stickers. I quite like um, stickers for my laptop and to go on notebooks and things to keep it entertaining. Here's a few um, from GitHub from our friends over there as part of the GitHub Campus program. Um, another thing is the travel. Um, I do quite like to travel around the world and um, speak at a range of different conferences. Uh, this picture is from last year's Igloo conference in Singapore. But probably the thing I that is my most favorite thing is just to be able to take an idea or a proposal or just come up with that idea and take it and turn it into some form of reality, no matter where I am. And this picture again is from the Igloo conference in Singapore last year, where somebody suggested at the developers day that maybe what I was showing as what was a hack afternoons piece of work should be a product and service that others could use. So whilst in the hotel one night after, um, whilst I was there on a few days holiday, I sort of thought, well, I'll sit down with a drink and come up with something. So that hopefully sort of sets some background to this. So as part of the services we deliver at Lancaster University, we're always looking for new ways to deliver services. Um, and this one was prompted by our Ask LU project, where students said it'd be nice if we could ask Alexa to suggest me something to read. And this sort of prompted last year's Developers Day talk, um, which you can catch on YouTube, I think, um, about how we could explore intelligent user suggestions. And so this was a sort of a hack and very raw code about what we could do to provide suggestions to our users. So that was a really good session. And I actually got some quite nice feedback from a range of you. So that would be like our students would love to use it at your own institution and um, that we've developed something quite unique and different. Um, some of you even want to know how you can get hold of it and use it at your institution. And the other one to be said, oh, it'd be nice if this was a product we could purchase. So back on my rooftop um, with a drink, I was sort of thinking, well, how could we do this? And obviously to build something, think this thing would need a name. And I should probably guess from the title, this name became Suggest For Me. And it was sort of along the lines of Lancaster Suggest For Me, so Alexa Suggest For Me, something to read. And I thought this was quite a catchy domain name and I do own the domain name before any of you try and register that. Um, so with that in mind, I was like, right, let's get started. How do we store the data? We're gonna need somewhere to store the data. And I decided to use Postgres. I'm very familiar with it. It's the default and most recommended database engine, relational database management system to use with Ruby on Rails, which I'm very familiar with. And I was like, yes, this'll do, created some tables. And yes, it was quite difficult to work with. So I thought, well, I've heard of MongoDB. We've, we've used that's used in quite a lot of places. Let's try using that. And again, it was similar problems of it's very good for storing the data, but it was just not very good for storing the relationships between the data, which is very important as part of this product and project where the relationship a student reading a book is the more important part than exactly what item they read or a student studies a course or an item is on a resource list. So with that in mind, I was trying to think of what's the best way of doing this. And after a bit of searching, it came up with using a graph database is one of the best ways of doing this because it treats relationships as first-class citizens in the schema. 
and I'd already actually used this for another project we'd done at Lancaster University on our physical user journey mapping. So with this in mind, I'd settled on, right, let's use a graph database. Um, and a lot of graph databases, there's a few different models that the, how they can store data, but the one I um, quite like is the property graph model. And this is what's in use by Neo4j, which is the project, uh, the database project we're going to use in this example. So if we look on the left, you can see we have an employee, that's a node. It's, it's an object, it's a thing. So, and they can have properties, which are name value pairs. So you can see we've got an employee who has a name and a date of birth and an employee ID. You can see we have um, other nodes. So we've got our company, our city, and then between them we have relationships. So this might be your, in your mapping table in a relational database, and these can have names. So it has CEO, and they can also have properties as well. So that's your name and vice versa, like your start date and a date there. And they can actually be directional. So they point from one thing to another and they go in that direction. And they represent actions or things to do. So verbs, so located in, has CEO. And this as a model is a lot better in terms of how to map and reflect the data we would be storing um, about user suggestions. So with that in mind, I start to think, well, how can we graph this engagement? What are the key nodes um, and relationships we'd want to map. So we'd want to map who our users are. So we don't need a node for a user, as well as a node for a course and information with properties about that cost, so the title of the course, when it starts, when it ends. And we'd also need some way of listing all the resources and the resource lists that we recommend to students to read from our academic staff. And then we'd obviously have the engagements of items, like things the students read both physically and electronically. So we want to say a student studies a course, so that might be an enrolled on relationship, and a course provides a resource list, is that the right word? Um, and a resource list suggests items, or has items, or exists on a resource list. And then finally we've got the item engagement, so these are items on the resource list that the user has read, or just other items in general in the library that they've read. So as I mentioned, we were looking at what we could use to do this and Neo4j stands out as one of the best platforms and tools for making this happen and they've got some really good documentation and um, some of the best documentation I've seen especially for explaining how the theory of graph databases but also with easy to follow examples generally based on things you might want to look at in the real world so with that in mind let's have a look at this graph database and walk through how we might create a basic graph that represents the engagements and the resources and the enrollment student have. So if we just switch over to our code editor. So over in our code editor, which I'm going to use um, Visual Studio Code for this example, you can see I've just created a quick um, connection class that's going to connect to our Neo4j database using a username and password with encryption turned off and it will just set the driver for a library called Active Graph, which is what we're going to use to create our user classes. Um, but we just set the driver to that. And on the right, we've got um, an instance of the Neo4j desktop app, where I've just created a new database um, for this demo. And if we open it up in the browser, um, and we say, just display everything that's in the graph, you can see there's nothing in the graph there at the minute. So with that in mind, Let's create a basic user class to add to, to represent a user from our institution. And type the word user. Include active graph node. So we'll say include a node, and this is going to be a node object on the graph. We're going to say the user has a name, and the user has a username. And we'll just create one of them and have a look at what that looks like on our graph. So we'll say create it with a name and we're going to use Faker to generate a name and a username so we don't have to worry about what these are. And Faker is a brilliant library for doing this, especially in your tests to just generate data so you don't have to think of it yourself. And if we run this now, if we say bundle a exec Ruby basic, all being well, and if we then have a look at all the data on our graph, you should see we get an object in the middle. Oops. 
Oop, I didn't save the file before I ran it, that'd be why. We rerun our query, you can see we've got one user here. And that's how easy it is to add a U a no object to the graph. So now we've got that user, let's add a course as well. Course. And we'll go say in again, this is a node. I say course obviously has a name. And we'll go give it a course ID as well. And again, we can just add that course to the database. And we'll type these in manually for this case. And we'll say it has a course ID 110. And if we run the query again, what you'll see when we look at our data in the graph is we should have three nodes now. We should have two users down here and then a course in the middle. So obviously that's not unless we enroll a student on a course. So to do that, we'll create an enrolled on class and we'll say includes active graph relationship. And this is going to represent the relationship between a student and a course they study. So we're going to say the thing, the relationship runs from the user to the course. And it has a property of enrollment date of type date time and that's the the date the user enrolled on the course now obviously we need a way to link the user to the course and probably a nice method to do that so if we just create a method on the course and we're going to say enrolled user give it a use give it the username and we're just going to say enrolled on dot create from node so this is the instance that we're going from so that's the user to node self so that's going to represent the course that we call this method on and then we're going to say the enrollment date is date time dot now so it's the current date time so if we now we now create our user so we can say we've got our user and we've got a course so we say course dot enroll user user and if we run our query again So you can see it's now giving us a little error here, which is tells us we just need to generate some migrations um, to represent the schema ID. If we just run them, oh, uh, oh, I've just forgot to copy our rake file across. So let's just quickly create a file here to represent those tasks. And obviously we're going to need a way of just telling us about those classes so when we create our migrations they work fine so to do that we'll just pull all of our classes we've been creating in the demo out to a file so we create a file called classes.rb and we'll just copy all these bits out and place them in this file here And they copy our user out and this will help us later on when we look at adding stuff from Leganto. We've got our three classes there. We're going to say require relative classes. And we're just going to do the same here as well. We just duplicate that line. Classes. So we're just, just going to run this in bin bash. And I know there's a slight problem with the running these commands in Z shell, which is what I use normally. You can see that's generated that one, and we'll just generate it for a user as well. And if we go rake neo4j migrate. So that's just going to set the primary IDs of our user records. And now we've done that, if we try and create this relationship again, bundle a exec ruby basic demo, all goes well, which it has done. If we give this a reload again, and if we just hide 
um, these. We just hide migrations. Hide them away. You can see we've now got this course and this user representing that the user is enrolled on the course. And you can see on there the enrollment date, which is the Unix timestamp for about 30 seconds ago. So hopefully that's going to be a very brief view of like how we can add data to the graph. But obviously that's not very useful um, in the use case I'm trying to demo of how we can make user suggestions. So to do that, let's go and create a couple more classes to represent the resource list and the items on it. So to do that, I'm just going to bring in some code from earlier. And we'll have a little talk through that. So you can see around the class for an item, it's going to represent a, a book or something the user's read as well as a resource list, which is going to have a couple of relationships, which we'll bring in. And we've got to add a relationship called onList and readItem, which are going to represent an item being on a resource list. Oops, let's de-indent all this. What are we doing here? Clean this up. as well as the item the user's read. So now we've got those relationships, let's just quickly show how they work. So we're going to create a new resource list and add it to the course. We'll put this down here. And it's very similar to them, we just create another object and then we use the two arrow syntax to say well there's a relationship called resource lists on our course so if we just scroll up a bit and if we just add in that relationship we just replace our user in our course with our new versions you can see that all oh, we've had some relationship between the courses and the items the user's read and the items that are on a resource list. But in this case, we're using the inline syntax to specify that the course has a relationship, but we don't need a specific class to represent the, the resource list relationship. And now we've got that resource list. If we just create a couple of items, so create a couple of books and add them to the resource list. And we're going to say that a user has also read one of the books. So if we run a query, if we just empty our graph database out. So what we're going to get is a little error here. That's going to tell us we need to run some more migrations. And um, which is quite easy to do. We can just scroll up, copy the two we need. Paste them in. And then we can just say, Break Neo4j migrate. And now, if we run our demo, ooh, we've got a slight error there. Um, I think this is doing my network setup, so just the only way I know to resolve this is just to start and stop the demo app again. Yes, I know, turn it off and on again. And if we open that up and then retry our query, we have a look in our query again. We query it and say, just give me everything that's in the graph, please. You can see here, we get this relationship between a course up here, and we can see that we have our student here who's enrolled on a course, which has a resource list with two items on, Graph 101 and Harry Potter. And we can see that our user here has read the item Harry Potter. So obviously you can see we can put quite a bit of information into the graph database, but the power really comes when we start querying it and sort of the syntax that we get for querying data. So with that in mind, I'm just going to pull in um, some code from earlier and just talk through how it works in relationship to a resource list. 
So we get, and um, we'll call this a complete demo. Paste some code in there. And now I'm just going to quickly put in um, mouse says, I'm just going to quickly put across our API key for Leganto. So we can query the API and pull out a resource list. Um, two seconds, I'm just going to hide that from you. So I've just added that in, and if we just clear the database quickly, And now if we, if, we run the, if we run the code for this complete one, and whilst it um, runs, I'll, I'll sort of talk through what it's doing. Yep. So what we're doing, it's quite simple. We're connecting to our graph database again. And we're just saying, get the, make a call to the Leganto API to get all these courses, so three courses here, we're gonna get Course one, two, and three. So that's the course ID in Leganto and the reading list ID in Leganto. We're just going to define some weights for how important an item is. And then for each one, we're just going to get the resource list and create a course to represent that in our database. Go through all the citations on that resource list and add an item to our database. And if it if the same item exists multiple times, we'll reference the one that already exists, which is this state here where we're saying, find the item and use it if it's present, else create a new item. And once we've added all of them in, we're just gonna create a user, enroll the user in all the courses from above and say they've read one item. So if we now run our query here, let's clear these up. You see, we've got a lot more powerful graphing. If we just full screen it, you can see we've got our user here and he's enrolled on this course, a course, 82433 something. He's also enrolled on these other two courses that also have items. Now this isn't a great example because there's no relationship between a course, an item and a course on another list. Um, and if we pull in our actual data, then we would see that. But this is quite useful for to ours to query the graph and sort of show how we can query this graph and get data from it. So what we're going to say is, we, we're going to make a query on the graph using this cipher query language. If I just expand this out. And you can see what we're saying is we're going to match a resource list um, that has a relationship to an item called onList where the, where the weight of the item on the list is greater than or equal to 25. And we're going to return the relationship, um, the resource list and the item. So if we run this query, you can see we get these blobs now and if we look at this 443 course if we just scroll down you can see this has quite a few different items on it but here we've pull, only pulled in anything where we've got higher weight and now what we're going to do is just execute another query to say get me everything that's rated 50 or above that the user hasn't read so this is sort of starting to go into that how we can make suggestions based off the data we should expand this out and put a query in so we can say we want to find users that are enrolled on a course that has a resource list and has items on that resource list where the items on the resource list are greater than 50 and the user hasn't read it and then we just go return the item the title and the weight so if we run this query you can see we get two items returned and now just to sort of show how that's filtering out resources i'm just going to run another query where we say just where we don't ignore anything the user's already read so all we've got to do here is say anything greater than or equal to 50. You can see how that returns four different items, one of them twice, because there's two relationships. But because the user's read it, when we say ignore everything, you can see that that doesn't appear at all. And this is sort of where the power of the graph is coming into its own for making user suggestions. You can just see from the, the query here how simple it is to write that. Imagine trying to do that with a relational database. So we just switch back over to the presentation for a, for a second.
you can hopefully see that by interrogating the graph, we can answer some questions like all the users who've read a physical item, all the users who study a course, which is generally a very easy one to do in a relational database. But as we go down that list, we want to get the items to suggest to a given user. And it's sort of this point where the power of the graph can show, because it means we can just query different things. So what are we actually doing in Suggest4 to do this? How we turn these graph query results into actionable suggestions? Well, it's actually very difficult to do anything more than naive suggestions at the minute. And we're taking the course of student studies and the items on those resource list, and then taking off any items they've already read, as you've just seen. But then we're using the weighting of the items if they appear in more than one list, we're sort of adding them weights together to try and weight things that are on multiple lists for the same student as a higher aggregate. And then where do we want to go with this a little bit more? So we want to start adding in like items just about other users or wildcard items that are from people who are studying the same program of study as them, but not the exact same course and module. To sort of widen that depth of data that users are looking at with their results. So hopefully that's giving you an idea of what you can do with a graph database. And to sort of give you an idea of the numbers of nodes we're talking about in this graph database and the scalability of it, is we have about 800, 800 to 1,000 resource lists at Lancaster. We try and keep the last one to three years available for any students, so the length of their undergraduate course. And it's, some of these can have up to 500 items. So if you do the maths there, we're up at looking at like 80,000, half a million items on our resource list and relationships representing that. We've got our undergraduate students, about 11,000. So once you start adding in all their relationships, we also want to return this quite quick. And obviously the 30 seconds on the right of your screen, that's not the time to query the graph. That's the time for getting us that data out of Alma and Leganto. So once we've got that data in this graph, we can query it really quickly. And because the graph treats relationships as first class citizens, we're not having to wait long for it to do anything. So I sort of mentioned there about loading the data in and how we're doing it. And also using the Alma, Leganto APIs. We're using other APIs from other services across the institution. We're also trying to pull in electronic resources using log crawling to sort of display a bit more data about and a bit more of a holistic view of everything that's been engaged with. And this sort of gives a nice byproduct of, well, we've got the data in the graph. We can actually query that and analyze the resource usage across the whole institution at the same time as providing suggestions to our user. So hopefully we can make suggest for available to you. We hope I want to make it open source especially the algorithm, so you can sort of understand what we're doing and how these suggestions have been made. And um, I think that's very important, especially in the current climate. Um, I think I quite like to say a hosted version that all of you can use without you having to run the code. But as it's open source, you could also do that yourself. And then finally, sort of how we can integrate that with discovery services such as Primo and display these results in line so the users can see them in the place they're using how we can better integrate with resource lists. So maybe you don't use Legant or you use Aspire and how we can make use of that. And then finally, how we can better integrate with VLEs and student record systems to pull more data in and make better informed suggestions. So if you go back to the rooftop where this all started, if you have an idea, why not just try it and see what you can do, hack it out. You might end up with what I did at last year's developers day, or you might end up with something more this year where with a bit more time we've start to create a service around this that we can represent that data to our users. So yeah, just try things and don't worry about making them safe and being safe with it. It's all right to fail. And if you've got any questions about this or how we do anything at Lancaster, just drop a message in the chat for the session or drop me an email or a message via Twitter. Thank you. I don't see any questions there. I know Alex submitted a few and I answered during the talk, so. Um, um, could you with the campus advice? Oh, I see. Looks like there is a couple there. Um, a campus advising system. I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to there. Um, but I know something we are developing at Lancaster that's maybe linked to that is a way of how we can suggest other things to students. Um, so things like who their academic advisor is how to book appointments with them, um, and also who our faculty librarians are. Um, so they can be directed to the right um, faculty librarian for their course and faculty. 
Um, so I think with your follow-up, Ken, I think that does sort of help direct it to the right person. Um, and is there a GitHub link for the code? Uh, not yet. I'm hoping to put one live either today or later this week um, after a few of the sessions. Um, and Chris, on the item types, you're looking at articles. Um, yes, it does pull articles actually in. Um, so it pulls the articles from um, when it pulls the citations and it is pulling articles in. And that is where I have to do a bit of a thing to generate an ID for the article. And hopefully tags is an interesting. So we use tags to do that essential recommended optional weighting. Um, but we could pull tags in and actually store the tags in the graph as well. It shouldn't be too difficult to modify it to do that. Have you tried uh, any other graph database like uh, Stardog or uh, or uh, uh, the one on top of um, Postgres? So I tried the one on top of Postgres um, and I thought that would be the best one to use because I've got a lot of experience deploying and managing Postgres. But, the, but I ended up going back to Neo4j just for a bit of their documentation it was mainly, yeah, documentation and also I'd used it before and the, it sort of worked a bit better for what we were trying to do because of how it treated relationships at the time. Mm -hmm. So, Okay. All right. Okay. Um, does anybody else has a question? Else we'll round it up. Um, I think there's still one more Q&A or... Uh, I'll just type an answer for that one. Um, around GDPR, so that's sort of is something we're concerned about, but also we already store this data, so we've already addressed the GDPR concerns. Um, we're not actually collecting any more data from our users than we already have. We were using it in a slightly different way, but from our initial feedback with students, that was something they'd be happy as using in that way. Okay, thank you all for uh, the questions. Thank you, Stephen, for your talk. Um